Hello, animation fans, and welcome to another iAnimate podcast. I'm your host, Larry Vasquez, and you're listening to episode 59. In this podcast interview, we have longtime DreamWorks animator Simon Otto joining us. Um, and as a special guest, we have Jason Ryan, who will be co-hosting with me. So get two industry vets for the price of one. Um, one of the unique parts about having Simon in this uh, podcast is that he has just recently left DreamWorks after about, I think, 21 years. Um, Simon has been with the company since the beginning, uh, early, early on with uh, Prince of Egypt, Sinbad, all the way up to this yet-to-be-released How to Train Your Dragons 3. Um, Simon has been a character animator, or a Hoka, uh, head of character animator, on uh, the How to Train Your Dragon series, so it's a very unique opportunity to get him in on this podcast. Um, this is about an hour-long podcast, and you'll see uh, <laughs> at the very end, we literally just scratched the surface, and so it was just a really unique opportunity to have someone like Simon, who has been an industry veteran in this uh, industry that we love, as well as Jason Ryan, who is co-hosting with me, and uh, for me, it was just kind of one of those things I was just sitting back watching and uh, listening and taking it all in, so I'm sure you'll enjoy this podcast. Let's listen in. Hey, hey what's going on, Simon? Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Larry, how are you? Hey, Jason. Nice to see you. You too, buddy. You too. <laughs> How's it going? Can, you guys, can you guys see me? No. Not yet. Yeah. Got your video turned off. Uh, let me see. Where can I do that? In the uh, bottom left. Uh, there. I see it. Yeah. There you go. All Check right. It. All right. Excellent. So how are you doing, man? Doing good. Yeah. You know, Excellent. I got the news flash. I was like, what? <laughs> After 21 years, what's going on? Yeah, when I sent, when I wrote that email, I said, you know, and I hit send, it was a little bit like launching a nuclear missile. <laughs> <laughs> I think like animation news, like everywhere was like. <laughs> uh, it, was pretty, it was pretty funny. I had to put my phone away. I was immediately bombarded. Oh, the thing is, I mean, I think people had a sense that I'd probably be leaving, but um, I was still talking to DreamWorks about uh, possibly doing something with them. Right. And, um, and I had already been on vacation. I'd like accrued five weeks of vacation or something like that. And, yeah. and then, uh, you know, it just kind of went, um, went nowhere, the conversation with DreamWorks. And that's just one Tuesday I had to go in and basically like do the, you know, exit interview and sign everything. And, and so, so I had to write this email. I had to also make sure that God, I, they, I wasn't prepared at all because, you know, I didn't have an email list. So I had to like go through, like it took me like three hours to go through, find all the email addresses I had and, and I launched like, you know, I think you can only send out an email with, with like a hundred uh, and I had to like five or six. <laughs> <laughs> and I went like enter, 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 and just so able to go out at the same time. Oh my God. <laughs> It's That's the thing, right. like the thing you never think about, you know, at all. No, right, because you, you were part of the part and parcel of DreamWorks, you know. Man. I mean, especially like the, the How to Train Your Dragon, you know, that trilogy, like that was all you, you know. Well, you know, I, I, was, a, I was a part of it for sure, but, and it was yeah. a long, long journey. Uh, but yeah, it's... it's and with this not, whole not, Netflix not thing, that, I, I mean, not to, I, I don't even know what you're up to next, you know. What you're yeah, neither do I. <laughs> but like this whole Netflix thing just seems to be blowing up too, you know, with James yeah. Baxter and Chris exactly. Williams and like a bunch yeah, so of there's, there's lots of opportunities out there. So you, yeah. it was time to like just at least get out and reflect a little bit and think about what, right. what other things could I do with my life, you know. My, right, right. Well, well I, don't, I don't want to blow it all here, Larry. <laughs> it seems no, like, it's good. It's, it's, it's getting my mind going. So. This, this, this should be like, we should probably just jump into the interview. <laughs> sure. I, mean, I, don't, I mean, do you want to, I mean, is it okay to talk a little bit about like that stuff and, and about your past as well? Are you uh, absolutely. I mean, I, 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 you know, there's nothing uh, that's, I, 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 you know, I'm, I, I left it on good terms, you know, and it's entirely yeah, possible that I'll re return back there, you know, I mean, perfect. Yeah, we can totally talk about that. Let's All see. right, cool, cool. All right, Larry, I mean, uh, you want to, uh, do you want to hit record or? Yeah, I've got it recording. And uh, Simon, very nice to meet you. I really just uh, appreciate you know, you joining us on this podcast. When I mentioned to Jason about it, he's like, "Dude, how'd you get that one going?" I was like, "That was a nice score." Uh, so yeah, <laughs> well, really thank just for thank you for having me. It's a, it's a, it's an honor. Awesome. Yeah, I just I'd seen it on uh, Twitter, and I hit. I, I I thought David Hubert mentioned that he had known you. I I didn't know if Jay had or not. Just I mean, obviously Jay was at DreamWorks for a long time, but he hadn't worked. Uh, I don't yeah. think on Dragons. 
So I just wasn't sure. So I hit David. Yeah, I, think it was, I think it was David, David uh, who reached out to me. And right. Yeah. During CTN, I think he was here. Yeah. And he was surprised. He's like, what? I didn't know. I said, well, he just posted this on Twitter. So, um, so yeah, he, he was pretty surprised too. So yeah, just really just appreciate you taking the time to, to join us. And I know you got a meeting later here. Um, but yeah, just, it's really cool honor. So I appreciate it. Yeah, it was, it's an honor for me as well, Simon. You know, in my short six years that I was at DreamWorks, yeah. uh, all our movies sort of leapfrogged each other, you know? So yeah. I never we got never, the chance to work directly we, with you. We were never on the same movie, right? Were we? Nope, nope. I think so, yeah. Mm -mm. Uh, yeah, I was, I mean, I've, again, I've been, you know, I was, I was stuck in this beautiful thing called How to Train Your Dragon for 12 years. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I didn't have a, a, bit, a lot of chances to explore other things, but... <laughs> Well, I, I, think, I think personally, like the, the, the trilogy, how, how, how to Dray a Dragon, it, I mean, it's so inspirational animation wise and story wise. I think it's probably my favorite of the, the you know, the, the trilogies that, that DreamWorks have done, like with Kung Fu Panda and everything is fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I think that one just keeps getting better and better. And I can't wait for the third installment. Yeah, I think it, it's just, it's just a, a, a series that manages to do do um so the balance between you know real plight real real uh real stakes for the characters and consequences but at the same time be adventurous and uh, and and fun you know I, I, that's that's the part i liked about it and that's what you know made me really want to stick through it and and finish the trilogy because i i felt like I'm sure other people like Dean and uh, Bonnie and uh, all these other um, POV who worked on it for the 12, 12, 15 years that they worked on it, um, you know, felt like it was their own baby. And I, I certainly felt like it was my baby as well. Hmm. It's interesting you say, um, you know, real stakes and things of that nature, because I remember listening to a deal from uh, Brad Bird and he was talking about that very same thing. Uh, uh, that's one of the things that, he felt like actually engages an audience when there's really, there's real stakes. It makes it feel believable. He talked about in contrast to, you know, um, episodic uh, cartoons where it, there's this danger, but you kind of know it's going to be fine because, well, guess what? we got to come back next week, you know, type deal. Yeah. Um, so there's always this kind of resolution that was fine so that we, we can get to the next week. Whereas in feature on these kind of things, there's real consequences. Like you mentioned, at least uh, for how to train your dragon and that, it, it did definitely become a staple, I think, in far, as far as the DreamWorks um, lineup goes, for sure. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and in a way, I mean, it was a, How to Train a Dragon 1 was, um, was very unusual in that, you know, it, it, we didn't set out, I mean, or, or at least the directors that were on before Chris Sanderson and Dean DeBlois, I don't think they set out to do something of that magnitude. I think their mindset was still... Uh, and I, and I, I, you know, I'm putting uh, words in their minds, I think, but that's, that was my feeling when I was on it. I don't think they set out to do something like that. They set out to, to make a move, to make a movie that's entertaining uh, at first and then, you know, have, have real characters and story and depth. But uh, I think we gradually, as we were making How to Train Your Dragon 1, and, and when I say we, I mean Chris Sanders and Dean DeBlois, they discovered how deep they can go with it. Because, mm -hmm. for example, for the longest time, uh, uh, spoiler alert, by the way, if you, if you haven't seen How to Train Your Dragon 1, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, Hiccup wasn't going to lose his foot uh, at the climax of the story. Huh. You know? And that kind of came actually in a conversation between uh, Dean, Chris, and Jeffrey Katzenberg and Bill Damaschke. And somebody suggested, you know, like, I think... I think, um, and you can find this, uh, Dean's talking about this beautifully because I wasn't in the meeting, but uh, I think uh, Jeffrey Katzenberg said, I think we should, I think Tutha should die. <laughs> 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 wow. and, uh, and they went, they went like, uh, uh, I don't think so, but we, they, I think they appreciated the thought. They were, they were impressed with his willingness to be uh, daring with this one. Nice. And that was after I think that was after like a first first test screen. Maybe it was internal or something. And then one of the story artists, I think it was Tom Owens, who had suggested earlier that you know you know uh, Hiccup could lose a hand or or an arm like Gobber and or a foot, and that's that's how they developed the idea that you know Hiccup would lose a foot. Mm. 
and and I think that's that. I mean, you didn't see that coming. I think if you had had never seen uh, or hadn't gotten a spoiler or something, you 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 were really surprised in that. And and all of a sudden, the movie reaches a different depth. Um, you know, like uh, uh, like movies did earlier. I mean, remember the depth of Dumbo or. Even like the ending of the original Jungle Book, mm-hmm. you know, with the kid walking away from her here, like those are those are moments I remember as a kid, and they really marked me. And I love those kinds of movies. I love these movies that that have a, a, a real, real pathos and consequences. And, yeah. And Simon, yeah. was it was it always so dramatic? Like even in the storyboards, uh, you know, like the, there was a, a part that I that I remember from when Toothless and Hiccup were facing each other for the first time and he's got the knife and he keeps looking at the knife and changing hands and he's so unsure of himself. And like these kinds of acting, like, I mean, was that part of the storyboards or was that more the animator? Like, I mean, how, how did that whole sequence come about? Oh my God, I don't, exa- I mean, I, I, I know it was in the storyboards. I can't remember who boarded the sequence, which I'm embarrassed to say because I, I'm sure it was uh, it was somebody really important, like Tom Owens or or Tron Mai, or, or I honestly don't remember. But um, uh, and that scene with the knife actually was animated by James Baxter, and <laughs> of and the, it was. the encounter, <laughs> yeah. you know, which is a really nice and powerful scene. And then the so yeah, I think it, that was already like that scene in particular when we started animating. The direction was very clear uh, of what how it should play and how it should be. And, and they, they really wanted it to be uh, a real intense moment. Mm. Very dramatic. Yeah. 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 Amazing. I mean, you had some superstar animators on there to help bring up the quality of the animation, but it feels like it just got better and better. Like, I mean, from the start of how to train the dragon one to, you know, from where we left off on how to train the dragon two, like the, and hopefully, the quality hopefully. of the acting was amazing. <laughs> Hopefully the third one too. Yeah. Hopefully you yeah. feel that way. Yeah. I, I um, yeah, I, I think that has m- many reasons. Um, obviously the first dragons was an, an evolution also because we started to understand what the stylistic choices that we made up front, you know, um, to have really naturalistic, truthful, um, acting performances, but done in a way that is exaggerated and stylized mm-hmm. that matched the visual style of the movie, which was we want really overdrawn shapes and big, a big world that's, 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 um, that has whimsy and that's, that's not a real naturalistic world, but the textures and the lighting and, and, and uh, the way... Um, you know, the, the camera was working, had, had true cinematic, um, uh, it should have a true cinematic feel. So that style, we knew that that was what that was, but you don't know until you actually animate it and say, ah, that works, that's really <laughs> great. And so it was really good that we have so many, that we had so many great animators who were able to pull it off because you can say that if you don't have the animators to pull that off and make it really entertaining and not just uh, um, a a copy of uh, a live action uh, reference, you know, or a borderline rotoscoped. That's a, that's a fine line to walk, by the way. And uh, so, so for, in the first movie, I think we started realizing what naturally works well. And we started understanding that the success of the, of the animation is the idiosyncrasy of the characters, like to really differentiate each character from one another. Uh, you know, of course, the dragons, uh, we, we really made sure that the dragons were different species and behaved differently. And we referenced all these different animals. And then um, by, by um, How to Train the Dragon 2, what came into play, what I think really uh, up the ante and, the, and the, the quality was also the tools. Like uh, How to Train the Dragon 1 was done on Emo which you know well. Yes, Jason. yes, that was the, the proprietary software for DreamWorks, yeah. From, from P, that came down from PDI. And then How to Train the Dragon 2 was the, basically the, the, the guinea pig for Primo, which is mm-hmm. the completely newly designed. It took us about three years to get this, this software um, developed, and it was an absolute success. Like all of a sudden, we, we were animating in high res, in real time, no more play blasting. Wow. And, and that changed everything you know that is a game changer yeah and i think uh, 
you know, I, I had to do a lot of like publicity about it because DreamWorks obviously wanted to put that at the forefront that there's a, that it's also um, that DreamWorks also developed technology for the movie. But it's really hard to describe what you're really gaining from it unless you're an animator. <laughs> you know, when you can start, when you know, oh, I can reiterate, a change is easier. I can, you know, we, can, we were able to draw and sketch. We had um, the ability to just be a little more detailed and, and, and find, uh, find the performance a little more through animating because you, you worked faster. You had a, your, from, you know, your idea was in the, in the, in the software faster, you know, on the rigs faster. So that was really a big, big game changer. And, and then just, yeah, we really knew what we were doing by Dragons 2. I think we knew what the animation uh, required. I mean, I was, I'm still to this day, you know, maybe that's <laughs> who I am, but I'm not entirely happy with the animation. <laughs> I, of course. I definitely think that, um, that in some places it's, you know, it's incredibly successful. And in other places, I, I, I wish we could be a little, we could have been a little more graphic and a little bit more stylized. Now, is that because production time schedule or like you said earlier, just still trying to figure some of that stuff out? Yeah, I think, uh, I think it's, uh, it's just the reality of production and also one of the, the risks of a faster software is also that um, you get something up faster. And once you have it in front of you and you start editing what you see rather than having to completely imagine the shot before and mm. then put it down. Like that's, a, 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 I mean, this, this conversation is, is um, ageless because even back in the day when uh you know milk call would have to do his animation and then he would you know he would basically thumbnail it would do a rough pass or blocking and he would shoot it on film finish it and shoot it on film one more time he basically would shoot it twice and that's it mm -hmm. and then video came <laughs> and then video came along and you could shoot it multiple times mm. and then by the time we were doing uh to the, uh, uh, during the time when DreamWorks started, you know, everything was digital. You shot digitally, you, so you could replace one, you know, one drawing and, and you didn't have to reach, like you shot endlessly basically. So you could try things out. And then going from 2D to computer animation, where now you can edit the animation, uh, you know, as much as you want. Going from Emo to Primo was like, well, now you can get there so much faster that you could just try it out. And the danger is that you don't, that uh, the tail is wagging the dog. Mm. And when you're doing that and you show something to a director um, and he tells you, well, it's not quite what I want. And then you show it again, eventually production starts like saying, okay, we got it. You know, it's, telling the story, it's telling the story. So do we really need to give this more notes? And uh, oftentimes that's where, I, I mean, obviously that's, it's a reality. We all understand. Um, you go, okay, well, let's just make the most important tweaks to this so that it works. And that's, by the way, that's a lesson that I tell any new supervising animators or heads of animation or anybody in some kind of a supervisory role. Don't aim for perfection. Never. Aim for this sort of gray zone where it's, it's really good. And then if an animator gives you great or perfection, then you take it. And, but you, are, you shouldn't be the one pushing for perfection. You should be the one for uh, like this, this place where nobody will go, well, this doesn't work. Mm. Everybody goes, well, that, that, I really felt the performance. Like it's really, it's about story. It's about performance. It's about, it's about um, stylistically, stylistic integrity overall, but it's not about perfection. Like consistency, right? Yeah, consistency exactly. of, of a quality rather than having something that's high and low, like and super great and super awful, you know, right, right. like somewhere so, in the middle, right? So when you work in a film and you know exactly what, what perfection could look like, uh, you know, there's always the hard part. Just, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm glad that I have a little distance to the movie now and when I can see it, I'll probably be okay with it. But <laughs> I, I would love to go in and change a lot of things, you know, but... Um, it's kind of a lesson you have to learn in, in production, certainly. Like in, in, the, in this third movie, 
because we were uh, making the movie under a changing leadership, we were like falling behind a little bit and we had to produce this movie in, in a pretty, uh, on a pretty high quota mm. to get it done. And, um, but yeah, so. What would be the quota like on, on the, the three movies? Like, is it like five uh, feet a week kind of thing, like 80 mm. frames or would it be something a little bit higher, like for the, for something with such a high crunch? I mean, one thing that I, um, I'm proud of uh, having helped to achieve at DreamWorks is that the conversation has shifted away from uh, a number up front, but it's shifted towards um, this particular scene with this many characters and this level of complexity should take an animator a certain amount of time based on a, a kind of a calculation mat matrix that, that we do. And also, depending on the seniority of the animator and who, uh, you know, uh, like all that also varies so what we went away is we went away from well you if you're, you're really behind you're not at five feet a week here or whatever it, whatever the number might be we stopped uh, having these conversations with the animators all together however me as the as the head of animation was under we were under pressure because we had a budget to do it so it was about managing complexity and um and pushing back on what's doable and what's not so we we started like we call it the junkie schedule basically where we assign an animator five six shots in sequence and tell them by this date this should come in and you manage what you're focusing on your time management what, yourself yeah, yeah. What, what is the most important thing for you and obviously we'll have conversations about that and uh and then depending on the animator, like a Fabio Lignini, uh, who's a, an absolute machine, um, I, I knew I could load them up with a certain amount. So I knew the animators pretty well, and I could, I could really get a sense of how much work everybody could do. Uh, in the end, I believe, I don't know the, full, the, the final number, but I think we were somewhere, we were averaging as a department somewhere uh, in around the six feet. Mm. Right, right, right. So, so it would basically be by sequence. So this sequence will take six weeks to do, right? And you're given your, your group of shots and you've got to get it done by the end of that sixth week. But, you know, so you've got to time manage your shots like so that you're showing it constantly and to make sure that it's all done and polished by then. Right? Basically, with the exception that we didn't so much work in sequence because that's very hard when you have um, uh, supervising animators per character. It right. was really by, by chunks of shots. Mm. Right, right, right. That was the other thing, like How to Train Your Dragon did shift away from the DreamWorks kind of sequence leads. It was well, more that, like that, a... That's, that's the PDI uh, sequence lead, right? Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, and we, we were, um, most of the supervising animators on, uh, on How to Train Your Dragon were uh, uh, DreamWorks 2D animators. You know, Fabio Linini, Jakob Jensen, not all of them, of course. We had Dave Torres and, and Cassidy Curtis as well up north. But, and Shaggy, um, was Shaggy those, like on Shaggy, there as well? Yeah. Shaggy right. was in there too and, and Gabe Hordos. And so we really, our most important thing was uh, we want character supervisors. We want to make the characters feel really unique and different from one another and uh, even if that means sacrificing a little bit of the style, which I, I think in the end didn't happen, but we really wanted to um, wanted to have that originality. And so we did it per supervising animator, and we tried to create teams of animators. You know, there's a lot of, there's, depending on the strength of the animator or, the, or the, 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 the specific talent of the animators, we would say, okay, this animator can do, does Hiccup and Astrid really well. So we cast them a lot of scenes with those two characters or, uh, we would say, well, we don't all need uh, toothless uh, specialists, need to be toothless specialists, but this person is really good with dragons, better than with humans. And then we try to sort of um, load that person up with all sorts of kind of dragons. And mm -hmm. So that's how we developed it. And we, we modified it as we went. We didn't, like, I think it's a mistake to create hard and fast rules that you cannot change. Mm -hmm. You have to be flexible. Flexible. Yeah. Right. That, that was the one thing that I did see different. Like when I was at Disney for the 12 years and then I moved over to DreamWorks, that was the big difference because we always had character leads. And it always seemed like it was, uh, it was harder to cast out. 
and, and, and to approve shots because if you had like a, a shot with five characters and they're five hero characters, then you had to have like all five supervisors in there going, well, that doesn't look like Hiccup and that doesn't look like, you know, this yeah. guy. This is, and they're like, oh my God, this is crazy. They met the levels of approvals. But at the end, the consistency of character was so much better. You know, it yeah, felt like true. that, that, that hiccup felt like hiccup. You know, there was no shots in there that you kind of go, that, that, he didn't, that didn't feel like hiccup at all. Like, cause you had those leads that were so exactly. yes, well, and, you know, you concentrated know, on that character. Right. And that's when, like when you actually do a trilogy and you manage to have a good number of animators that animate across the three movies, like by the end of the, I mean, by, by the third movie, you know, we had a lot of new animators who hadn't animated on, on the Dragon movies before, but the, 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 the real core of the team were all, you know, Dragon animators. Excellent. And yeah, yeah. we were, like, the conversations we would have, for example, with somebody like Fabi or Shaggy, was never about, um, well, Astrid would do it this way or Astrid would do it that way. It would, the launches were really about what's the, what's the emotional... Um, reason uh, behind an action, or what was the purpose of the of the of the, the shot, and and then they would go away and they would come back with final shots. Yeah, yeah, which allows you to be enormously efficient. Yeah, because right? you don't discuss detail anymore. You just discuss the the the, the general what you want one out of it. How does how do you make this shot entertaining and original and 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 emotional like those things and and that was i think for them also a real joy because i think it must be really hard um for somebody like shaggy or fabio or uh you know dane stogner or people like that who worked on the same characters for so long to go on a new movie where that's led by other people and <laughs> all of a sudden they tell you that doesn't quite feel like you know whatever uh the character might be because they 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 really they, they went beyond that uh, on these movies right i mean they was, wear the actors on the screen pretty much right completely. You and, know? Uh, and dean would um uh, as a director would really like even sometimes say i don't want to give you too much direction you have the voice you he, this is what the shot's about but the rest i want to i want to get your your take on this so he would direct them more and more, not everybody, but some of these top guys, more and more like he would direct an actor uh, at the microphone. Mm. Yeah. That's fantastic. Seems like a great way to give um, trust to the artist and get the best out of them as well. Give them enough direction, but know that they're going to be able to give their input as well. Exactly. And, and that's really, I mean, that's really Dean's strength. Dean uh, is the type of director who creates a, uh, a really powerful and moving structure to which he allows people to attach their own takes. Like he, he gave me an enormous amount of freedom to, to um, direct the animation into places where I think it needed to go and, and trusted me enormously. He had certain things he felt very strongly about, like particularly the key moments like he was really he was really um adamant about the turning points of the stories where where you know like uh, where uh, the story moves from one thing into the other or where an emotional thing had to come across and then others other moments he would just kind of let us do our thing Mm. And I, I know he does that with uh, with the, the other the other departments too. I mean, he does it. He did it with art. Like on How to Train a Dragon Two, a very interesting thing happened. Um, he had written the movie with the big um, uh, bewildered beast being a fire spewing dragon. Like he would just basically uh, lay waste to this entire land with a big I don't know sp spewing fire um, uh, tornado. And uh, POV, the production designer, Pierre-Olivier Vincent, he uh, came back with the idea, I think we've seen fire, let's do something different. And mm -hmm. said, I, wanted, I would like to suggest that he spews uh, ice. And then Dean you know, came up with the logic of liquid nitrogen and all that. But um, 
but the, it created, and the reason, the argument behind it was that it creates a different imagery through the entire movie with the, with Valka's layer of, uh, you know, these ice, ice peaks. And that's the, the kind of example where Dean is an amazing problem solver when it comes to story. And he can react to new ideas and make them meaningful within the story. Mm. Well, I think it was on that um, Creative Spark I watched that you had done. And one of the things that you'd mentioned was animation is a team, sp and you kind of was kind of in quotes, team sport. And that's what I love that I'm hearing about this because there's so much more that comes out of a collaborative process. You know, you're going to think of something that you might not have thought of until someone says it, you know, and it's like, oh, okay, now you've, I got this idea now based upon what you have just said, you know. Yeah. And so I, I love that aspect of that collaboration process. But it's like you're mentioning here, you need somebody who can, like a dean, who can give enough input, but also trust the artist. Absolutely. I think you're, I think if you think you're, if you think you're an auteur in, uh, in, in the mainstream Hollywood type of animation, I think what you're doing is limiting the, 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 I, the well of ideas that could come out of a crew. Mm. I think if you're doing an auteur film and it gets shipped around the world and executed, then I understand that you want to really, really control everything as much as you can. Um, but, and in live action, it's also probably a little bit easier to do that because it, it's about writing a script and then go out and shoot it. Mm -hmm. And in that intense moment of those three months where everybody's together, um, you know, you really try to control as much as you can, but you probably can't. Uh, so I get it. But in animation, I, it's, it's all about, like nothing is ever solidified, right? So you, <laughs> you as a director, you have to make sure that you focus on the things that really make this tick and that you let others, you know, decorate it basically. Mm. Uh, and uh, it's funny, but probably um, some animators uh, that worked with me, it, it gives them the heebie-jeebies that, that word. Uh, it's a team sport because I always said something and that uh, others might interpret it as typecasting. But for me, I looked at my job as um, like a coach, like I'm a, I'm a team coach and I'm a, I'm a big soccer fan. So uh, for me, it was, I, I, I thought of myself as a, as a uh, soccer coach which means that on a team you have your strikers, you have your midfielders, you have your defenders. And yes, you can get a defender to score a goal every once in a while, but that's not its pri his prime job. That's not where he's best at. And, mm -hmm. and finding out where animators are not only giving you the best quality, but also giving you the best quality at a certain pace, which will then allow you to use the means that you have, the time that you have to maybe invest on something else a little bit more. And uh, there were a few animators that did tremendous work. Like uh, I'm thinking of somebody like Bill Diaz, who uh, did a lot of the flight sequences. He was amazing and incredibly efficient at it. And um, I know deep down inside, Bill would have loved to probably do some more um, human acting shots, but and we had these conversations, these were open conversations, but uh, uh, that I, I, I in, it wasn't in the best interest of the movie to use his talent for that, but use his talent for uh, some of the, the fly, flying shots because he understood it. He was fast at it. He understood the differences in the characters and he would just go away and bring it back and it'd be <laughs> basically done. <laughs> and uh, and that's 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 really wonderful. I, I appreciated those guys enormously. They were just as important as, you know, the somebody like Jakob Jensen who do a lot of the hiccup medium close up shots that were very very um, specific to how hiccup behaved. You know, his sort of gangly shoulder bouncing character that that hiccup was. And so you you really I I I really saw my, my job as somebody who's moving pieces into the right place in order to really bring out um, the originality of the characters and, and, and make the movie the best it can be. Mm. So that's, that's when I say, like, that to me is also a team sport, is, is, is understanding that it's not just about your own personal career and growth, although that's important because that keeps you motivated. If you, just, if you get typecast and you just do things you don't like, 
eventually you're not motivated and you lose interest and then your work is is subpar right uh, you'd have to be an enormous professional to still create absolute top-notch work if you're not motivated it's really, really difficult you know what i mean yeah i remember you saying years ago simon that at a certain point in a movie you stop evolving as a person <laughs> yeah <laughs> which is always like so interesting you know i mean that's how i felt like right now in these last uh, two months since i finished the movie i feel like i'm in this um you know, uh, I'm like a deep sea diver and I'm slowly coming up, <laughs> decompressing every hundred meters in order not to get your head to explode, you know. And, 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 and I think it's really important that, that you live life as well because it's where your inspiration comes from. And by, I know that sounds cliche, your inspiration. I'm not talking about looking at the flowers and, and being struck by inspiration, but the observation that we need as, as, as animators and storytellers, by the way, I think it goes for writers and directors too, mm. is you have to see real life in order to caricature it. Mm. That's so true. I remember I mean, yeah. years ago, sorry to touch on that exact point, uh, Gary Goldman, uh, like from uh, the Bluth era, you know, I never went to Bluth, but he actually came to my college as I was doing my third year movie. And uh, he said, you know, don't like bury yourself in your work the whole time you can't do this 24 hours you know and i really wanted to do that but he was like yeah. you know if somebody invites you out for a drink or to go to a, a bar or a disco or something like go out because you're going to get that inspiration <laughs> you're going to see them do gestures that you can actually pull from yeah and it's also incredibly unhealthy to work uh, <laughs> as an animator for that much because you're going to end up with a herniated disc or some really, <laughs> really terrible back problem but yeah no i i i, I feel very strongly about that um and also you have to like you have to some people say well you can do that by consuming entertainment but i always feel like and i say that to the animators and i think that's a really important thing to consider is if you really want to create great uh, animation and tell great stories you have to caricature from real life because otherwise you run the risk that you that you caricature something that's already been caricatured um, and the same goes like you could work and then you could watch a lot of movies and uh, watch a lot of entertainment. And yes, that's really important because you, you get inspired by how other people view the world and you see commonality in that. Like I, I love watching stand up comedians when they, you know, because when they caricature uh, with their own bodies, a certain personality or a celebrity, you go like, God, I, I can't believe he saw that. I, I never thought of it this way until mm -hmm. this person did it. That's very important, but you also have to see what does what does it look like when a bird lands on a branch? You know, like that's uh, that that was a um, in my flight school lessons that we did uh, on all the movies. Um, I always said, don't caricature an animation. I mean, don't don't copy other people's animations in how they did a flight of a bird because you're caricaturing possibly something that's caricatured wrong mm. you have to understand the matter from within from the from its own its its logic and how it exists in nature and then work from there and and i think we i think that's one of the maybe the proudest things i have about how to train a dragon from a pure technical point of view is i think we got we got flight we we got flight right most of the time not always but most of the time from yeah, the, did, did you have Stuart Samita give uh, a class on that and then uh, like to talk about the anatomy of the wings and everything? Yeah, Stuart was, uh, was important for sure. Yeah, he, he came in a few times, I mean, many times. And I have a pretty close relationship with uh, Stuart. I think Stuart for me was a little bit more, I don't know, he, he, did, he did, we had several classes with him about flight. But um, there were others also that came in flight. We had falconeers come in. But I, I think it was really something because I've been animating birds ever since uh, school. I did a, a seagull in school, then I did the eagle in spirit, and then I did uh, some shots, uh, some 2D shots, or a 2D shot of the um, crane and panda and then dragon. So it's something that has followed me along, and I really love it. And so I, 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 I think the sources came from many, many different places. That's great. Uh, and then, of so, course, Simon, can you touch a little bit on like, uh, like your background, like how you got into mm -hmm. 2D animation? Because not a lot of people know like where you come from or yeah, yeah. 
what, you know? what's, what's this Schwarzenegger uh, like <laughs> Get to the chopper. <laughs> Get to the chopper. <laughs> California, animator. Uh, well, I'm from Switzerland, so the German-speaking part of Switzerland. And um, I, I grew up in, at the base of the mountains, like about 45 minutes outside of Zurich. So not, not completely out in the woods, but, you know, nice, nice, nicely tucked away in nature. <laughs> and, um, and I always loved uh, drawing and I loved uh, Disney movies. I mean, that's, I grew up with it. I have actually a fun, funny anecdote. Like, I had uh, two or three warts on my fingers as a kid, as like an eight-year-old kid. And we, my mom had to take me to Zurich to the university hospital to have them like burned off with like liquid nitrogen. I think mm -hmm. they did it. And as a reward, she took me to this uh, theater in Zurich who were, was playing Disney movies all year long. Like they would play two or three Disney movies all year long. And every time after that, she took me to a Disney movie. And I remember Aristocats and uh, I, I think John Book I saw later, but you know, Beauty and the Beast, uh, and, uh, Sleeping Beauty and movies like that. And they just touched me so much. I, I couldn't understand how this was something, you know, and I loved it. And then through comic books and uh, like Tintin, Asterix, uh, Spirou, all those, the, even the Donald Duck movies that were very popular in Europe that were, I think, made in Denmark. Uh, I really wanted to be an, uh, a draftsman and I started drawing uh, like crazy with some, some schoolmates. And then eventually, uh, to fast forward, I, um, I, I actually was, because, you know, when I told them I wanted to be an animator, like the, the, the school counselor, they, they, it, I might as well have asked to become an, an astronaut or something completely <laughs> practical. They, well, you, you know, you're in Switzerland, you should be a banker. <laughs> so I did a, I did a three-year banking apprenticeship. And I knew from day one, from week one, it's like, there's no way I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. <laughs> and, uh, and I... Um, <laughs> I really uh, was sort of looking around how to do this. And one, I came across during my, I had to do military service, which in Switzerland is like five months. I met somebody who was doing snow sculptures uh, professionally. And, uh, and I got in and became a snow sculptor for an entire year and built like in the summer, you prepare these giant snow sculptures for hotels, resorts, and, and you know, events. And I did snow sculptures for a year. Huh. And that actually proved to be pretty critical because from there, I was able to get into art school. Um, I, when I applied to the Gobelin School in Paris, I applied to multiple schools like, um, uh, 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 what's it called? The Tor Toronto Film School. Oh, Sheridan? Sheridan, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sheridan and the New York uh, School of Visual Arts. And... And those schools were much more expensive than the Paris school. And I got in, which was insane that I got in. And I believe to this day that I got in because I had snow sculptures in my portfolio. And I felt like, <laughs> That's well, fantastic. That guy is. <laughs> <laughs> and I got into the Goblin school. And from there, um, a pretty quick, actually after a year, it was right at the time when DreamWorks opened. They had just started uh, the Prince of Egypt. And because of a lot of the Amblin animators who came from Europe were Goblin graduates, uh, they came to our school in the first summer that I was there, um, and three of us got hired after one year of school and finished our school year while already having a contract in our hands. Man, and uh, and came, uh, got to DreamWorks, and that's where I started. And I started on the Prince of Egypt as a two D animator. That's remarkable. Isn't that that amazing? Is like, yeah, <laughs> that's crazy good. It's a pretty. It's pretty. Uh, it's a pretty. Like now thinking back. <laughs> That journey is like is filled with if this tiny little thing didn't happen i would have never made it you know <laughs> if you didn't see that snow sculpture guy <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's amazing you know what's cool about that though too is that i've seen enough uh, stuff in modeling and sculpting and stuff that you can see a lot of similarities with animation in regards to volume and shape and uh posing and things of that nature so it's just kind of funny that something that it has nothing really in one sense to do with animation yet it would help you look at something like that for animation yeah it's interesting i think there's two two uh things that i have that i think really are probably at, at the core um the the things that i think make me 
you know, uh, uh, pu pushed me forward and, and made me succeed. And A is that I, I always loved sports and I loved doing sports. So I was, a, I, I played team handball. Probably none of you know what that is. It's some weird uh, soccer that you play, play with your, with your hands. Basically you pass the ball to each other. It's completely unknown in America. Unfortunately. <laughs> it's not like basketball without bouncing the ball. It's basketball with goals. Oh, wow. But it's, it's super. I mean, if you, if you, if you Google team handball, you, you'd, you get sucked into a rabbit hole because it's really physical. It's as, as physical as, uh, you know, uh, it's almost like rugby, but maybe not, you don't tackle each other, but you can really like you, you push you, and shove you, and stuff. Yeah, you're physically, physical. And it's really, it's really cool. But basically I, I loved sports and I love playing soccer. I loved skiing. I skied on my, and I think that the, the analysis of movement, the, the breaking down of understanding how you have to move in order to do certain things, it's something that I always loved. I loved movement. I loved uh, the, you know, change of, uh, um, in, uh, like how to uh, change the, your um, body attitude and change, change your, um, the thrust of, of like the inertia kind of thing. Inertia right? and energy and how, how to do that. Like, I, I really loved that. The analysis of that too. So I love that. And then the second thing uh, I think is um, not only did I love drawing, but also I loved the, uh, uh, three-dimensional thinking I remember I, I remember my brother commenting on a drawing I did at school like at I don't know in second grade or something like that everybody like there was a newspaper uh, contest and I was one of the ones that got picked and there, it was something about houses and I was the only one who drew a three-dimensional house <laughs> And my brother said, like, wow, that's really impressive. You threw a three-dimensional three house. And I, I don't think anybody taught me that. I just, I always imagined in three dimensions. Like, I mm -hmm. think my drawings were more three-dimensional than maybe the average kid. I don't think I was a particularly amazing draftsman ever, you know, uh, to this day. I don't think, I'm, uh, I don't think that's really my, my, my talent. You know, like when I see some other people like Jakob Jensen or, Nico Marley or Rune, Rune Benike, when I see those guys draw, like they, they put it down, you know, like they, <laughs> see it, they put it down. I have to like work, I, I edit my drawings a lot, you know. But, but yeah, those, th those things I think helped me um, evolve as an animator fairly quickly. How, how was the transition from 2D to 3D for you? Um, emotional because I didn't really want to because I had uh, always planned to be uh you know become a supervising animator of my character and really like i could hang my drawings afterwards like all oh, this this idea that you have of what an animator career is mm. i still had that in my mind and that i it's a lesson that i've learned which was don't close your eyes to opportunities to present themselves because you have a certain idea of how your career is going to go because your career is not going to go like that. Very, very few people can actually plan a career and then actually do that career for the next 20, 30 years. Mm. Um, and then you can see it with the, with the, even the amazing Disney animators that, that did 2D animate until recently. I'm sure if 2D was still alive, they would still be doing supervising animation on, on Disney movies. And they had to either reinvent themselves as a, a story artist or directors, or they had to uh, pick up computer animation or, you know, become real estate agents or whatever they want. To. Yeah. You know, so I think I, I missed a couple of opportunities in my career that I didn't even consider. Like when I was in school at the Gobelin, they, um, they talked to us about Toy Story and they showed us the first Toy Story and I loved it. But I had no ever even considered that I would do computer animation. Mm. It just wasn't what I want, what I then, how I had planned my career. And, uh, and uh, you know, I think the Iron Giant was one of those opportunities. Like, there's so many opportunities where I didn't think that, hey, that's something that I could be doing. It could be maybe a completely new door that, I, that, I, that could be really exciting. And I think right now is a time for that too. But just to quickly answer your question. So it was emotional because I... Although I, at that point, loved computer animation, and I, I, we did some early tests, and I immediately like, wow, this is awesome! Like you can get, like you can give life to something that's in a different way, and that's that that's maybe not a drawing, but it's a, it's it's still a character. And I got into it really fast. It actually it, it was 
it was fairly easy. It obviously, had growing pains, but it it was something I enjoyed immediately. Mm. Um, so it was more the the not being able to do the other thing anymore that was okay. The problem. So you didn't find it like technically a hurdle or anything. Maybe just in the beginning, but maybe just. Uh, yeah, I mean the way you the way you the way you have hurdles when you get a new uh, phone or something. You know? Right, right. Yeah, <laughs> no, absolutely. Just learn the software. Show me how to set keys and exactly you know, that part. And then, and then, but I, but it was also exciting to understand. Oh, this guy, you know, approaches animation like this, like layers. And you know, I was still in post to pose, which I still more or less am. But oh, this guy uses uh, references and brings it into this machine. I got like. Remember that time? There were all these people with really varied workflows, and and uh, I don't know if you remember guys like Yair Contour who would yep. basically create his own rig with like simple <laughs> shapes, animate it first, and then parent the character to it. Like insane workflows, but that that were really brilliant, and that that was exciting. I think to see like how how differently people go about it. Mm. Yeah, like like in two D, there was like pose to pose and it was straight ahead there was a combination of the two and then but cg like there was like 50 different ways to work you know <laughs> yeah, yeah. exactly it's, i remember yeah. uh, cameron fielding i had him on a podcast and he had done that shot in um uh oh shoot what's it called go to europe jay i think you were you were oh, madagascar three. madagascar thank you where yeah. the monkey uh, is going around on the car or the um chandelier and there's oh, a he's putting on lipstick and, yeah yeah it goes yeah, out yeah, the window and stuff like that and he said all i did was grab a, a a block animated that and used that now as my reference and stuff but he got the time I, I, down I, something simple over there i've seen that i i i saw that uh that that block animation Mm. Uh, I mean, Cameron Fielding talking about a talented guy. Like he came, he came onto Dragons One, and he had done this this really insane like guy fighting a, a dinosaur. Yeah, yeah, Turok. I don't know if you ever seen that? Yeah, yeah. And I think he was also he was one of those guys who came in and and showed a different workflow, not categorically different, but he just came about it. He went about it uh, differently. He used live action references very well, and then just loosely, like, banged through it on twos or fours. And his shots had so much um, power and yeah. were so dynamic that you know, he did some amazing work in Dragons One. And it was a real loss. God, if we think about you know all the people that have left DreamWorks, <laughs> like you, Jason, or yeah. uh, Cameron Fielding, or all those guys who are PDI or now at Pixar. Pate, Dave Pate as well, right? I mean, all these amazing talents that have uh, that have come through DreamWorks. Uh, it's, it's pretty, pretty incredible. Yeah, and we were on the, the, the same uh, showreel review. Like every, you know, it was like every Monday or something, Larry, we would have a showreel review and we'd have some of the supervising animators there. And when Cameron Fielding's reel came up, we were like, holy crap, I've never seen that crappy rig look so good <laughs> it was like this really free yeah. rig that was kind of blocky and he had, had, her, had her sitting down smoking a cigarette and yeah. i was like look at that thing it's moving really well i've never <laughs> seen that thing move so well <laughs> yeah and, and and he's another guy one of the i mean we've lost some guys to the gaming world and he was one of the guys who mm -hmm. where is he at um up in uh, vancouver uh seattle right or i think he's in valve Valve, that's right. That's yeah, I know uh, Jamal Bradley's up there as well. Right. Yeah. He was at DreamWorks yeah. beforehand, went up there. Um, yeah. Kind of going, I had a question here a little bit, so this is kind of making me segue a little bit because you talk about, you know, losing some of these guys here. Obviously, you guys are getting new and fresh talent. I know uh, Robbie Govin is over there. Um, George, uh, or Jose, I'm sorry. George Jorge Garcia, Garcia is there. Jorge Garcia, yeah. Yeah. Um, some guys that we're very familiar with have gone through our program. Um, how do you get guys like that up to speed on stuff like this here? I mean, generally we've been so lucky hiring people. I mean, that's still, I guess, working at the big studios, it's a studio where people really want to work at. So you have the choice of great talent and it's really, it's challenging to really, make sure that's the that's the right guy like you know some people have turned out to be great and that you didn't expect to be great and others not so much mm. but um it's really easy actually coming to dreamworks is uh i think it's pretty easy the the software is really 
you learn it very quickly. If you've if you've done Maya, if you used Maya, it's again it's the the period where you go like you have certain workflows and you have you want to do certain things a certain way and you kind of have to maybe rethink it a little bit. Um, but um, it, I don't think people struggled very much to get on there. And you know the campus is amazing. You know, yeah, <laughs> Dreamworks campus is such a such a life at DreamWorks is really pleasant particularly in the beginning when you get jaded and you forget that it how beautiful it is and it's not so important that you get free lunch anymore that you forget about all that <laughs> then uh then it can get sometimes a little bit like you can get a little frustrated because you might be on a movie that you know, on a sequel that you weren't too fired up about or but generally life is really really is really good you know i think people like working at dreamworks mm. i mean when uh, you get to animate characters i mean it's it's a pretty amazing yeah uh, job <laughs> yeah, yeah and I, I think also um so far and again you know i'm not there anymore at this moment at this moment but uh i think people the, the the footage pressure is real and it's there um but we generally have smaller crews on a film so we i, I think in the last six six to eight movies we've not uh, exceeded uh, 50 animator or 60 animator mark so you have real impact on a film mm. it doesn't get diluted by uh, you know doing a movie in six months with 120 people <laughs> um, which I understand sometimes that's the way you have to make a movie but um, I, uh, I think that's a really good thing and we don't it's not very clicky as far as I see it, but again, I'm, I'm maybe I'm seeing it from the click point of view, so it's possible. <laughs> but uh, there's there's like a lot of like there's people from a lot of different backgrounds, a lot of different studios, and and I think it's generally a, a very warm and, and healthy environment. Comp nice. Competition is not because we had um, because we had only small phases of layoffs. We had some obviously some really dramatic layoffs that were really sad and, and, and heartbreaking but uh, generally you know you work on multiple movies and you don't have to prove your survival uh, through the movie uh, in order to get on to the next movie. next one gotcha. that's, that's not that at least uh, during the time I was there that's not the philosophy that the DreamWorks the philosophy there is to build you up over time and try and make it you to be a long-term employee there Gotcha. That's amazing. So speaking of that, which, uh, so Simon, w what's the evolution of Simon Otto? Like, where do, where do you see yourself now? Well, I, I don't know yet. I, um, I mean, for me, uh, you know, between the uh, Dragons 2 and Dragons 3, I directed some TV uh, episodes. I think I saw Troll Hunters too, right? I, did, I, I did a Troll Hunter episode and I did two Dragon TV episodes. And um, I storyboarded on both Dragons 2 and Dragons 3 and some of the specials and the TV shows. I, I feel like I've, uh, it's time for me to try and make the jump to directing. Mm. That's your evolution yeah. right there, yeah. That, that's what, I, that's what I'm, I'm hoping to do. Like, you know, I, I could fail miserably at it. It's still a possibility. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> but I, 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 I definitely feel like I'm at, uh, at the point in my career and, and I have the the skill set that I need to do them uh, to attempt the jump. And so I, I'm, I was trying to, to take a little bit of time and look at everything. And, and I have some, I have some offers and opportunities. I'm just trying to pick the right one. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what I was, we were talking about, I think beforehand, this is what's been, I think so neat um, with companies like Netflix and Amazon and Hulu and things of that nature, where you're getting these, I think more of an opportunity for people like you. Um, I did a podcast sometime back with Clay Cadis, um, and I pulled up Netflix here recently and see a, a new Santa movie with uh, yeah. Kurt Russell. And live enough, action Santa movie. Yeah, directed by Clay Cadis. And so it's just, it's a neat time, I think, um, where it's not so confined and, and limited, I guess, in, as far as who can be a director. Yeah, and I, I you know, remember, like uh, Clay Cadis and John Cars were, Heads of animation on Tangled, mm -hmm. that's correct. Which yeah. was yeah. which was done at the same time as I was the head of animation on Dragons, mm -hmm. and uh, so these guys ventured out, you know, um, Patrick Osborns and yep. people like that, and they've done amazing things, things since, you know. Yeah. Uh, 
I, I mean, I don't know if you saw uh, John Carr's um, uh, Google, Spot, Google Spotlight the sea, story. Um, something by the sea. It's yeah, it's uh, it's called um, Age of Sail. There you go. Okay. I mean, it's just beautiful, and and like if I could see myself doing something like this, even if it's uh, a short or mm. uh, a TV show, or I think it would be really satisfying to to me. And and it's it's some um, like I feel like there's uh, the stuff inside of me that wants to come out, and mm. I've um, made a career out of helping. Uh, other people's ideas come to fruition and I think that's okay that's part of the job and that I love it and I don't think I would have been really ready much much earlier but now I feel I feel like it's it's time for me to try it out if I fail I think I can go back and be an animator or a story artist or you know um, whatever it may be so I have a little time and and uh, as you said the opportunities have never been that great um, I do, I do have also concerns about it because one of the great things about places like DreamWorks and Disney and Blue Sky and uh, you know, Pixar is it's a hub where everything gets made in the same pla- in the, at the same place. Mm-hmm. In-house. <clears throat> yeah. So the, the value of hallway conversations uh, with a story artist or a director or other people who work on the movie is incredible because it creates culture it creates a a a sense of um we're all in this together and let's make it the best thing we can and listen i've i've only worked in tv where things get made on the other side of the planet and in tv of course it's disconnected because of for budgetary reason i don't know how it is to make uh spider-man for example at sony be a director there while it gets made at imageworks i have a feeling that's probably as good an experience as you can have because it's the same time zone it's mm. it's uh it's the same same language it's it's it's, um, it's the same company i'm sure that's that's a, a gr- still a great experience but it's i don't think it beats um, everything in house like there everything in the, at the same place place but you know that seems to be the future uh it seems to be like where where most other studios are heading. I don't think DreamWorks is heading there. As far as I know, it, it, of course, you know, we never, we never thought that uh, we'd open a studio in India and then we opened the studio in India. We all thought that was terrible. And then we worked with India and it was amazing. <laughs> they did amazing work there. Uh, so again, like it, it, you can, I try not to feel too strongly about these things and take things as they come and make the best out of it because you most likely it's not as bad as you think it is. And I think you kind of mentioned something earlier too, those not hard and fast rules. So just because certain companies are kind of doing this doesn't mean other companies will. It, there's that, right? there's pros and cons on all ends. So exactly. someone's going to find more ones more comfortable with for their yeah. culture. I mean, what I'm most excited about uh, besides, obviously, if, if I have a chance to direct a feature movie that I feel like is right for me at, at any of the big studios, what I'm really excited about is like, what what is the stranger things of animation, for example? Mm-hmm. Like a, uh, a TV series or a mini series or an event series that that is not your classic TV model where um, uh, where where it's, uh, you know, like you sort of at the end of the episode, we return to um, square one and tell a different story every time. Or um, like, like what I think Stranger Things did, and, and of course, I mean, it starts with The Sopranos and you can go further back to Twin Peaks and, and, and stories like that. But now it seems like that's what a lot of filmmakers are attracted to these kinds of stories because you can, A, um, uh, really get into the characters and tell a story with depth and and true progression um and you can get which i think didn't happen uh, on twin peaks and shows like that you can binge watch it mm. right so right yeah. you can watch three four episodes and be sucked in it's a little bit like to me those are it's the the advantage of a of a of a movie okay with the downside that you're not in a theater with a hundred other people but you mm-hmm. advantage of a movie where you really you have um, more uh, time. highly cinematic, high budgets, uh, you know, like a real quality show. B, you can binge watch it, which 
gives you the experience of like reading a book where you read it over 10, 14 days and your life is colored by that thing, you know, <laughs> by, the experiencing, by the experience of reading an amazing book. Like, I don't know what, I don't know, when I watched Breaking Bad, you know, when that, when that season came out, like it was the darkest time in my life, but it was amazing. <laughs> I remember my wife and I watched Breaking Bad on a, on a vacation in Mexico. Oh. And we would stay up till three in the morning and be completely horrified by the world and not terrible at all. It's been so amazing, so sucked into the show that it colored our vacation with this really dark, dark cloud. It's, but it's, I, I love that. And I, I feel like I picture, like, imagine Zootopia with a, uh, a murder mystery that's drawn out over 10 episodes mm. with that level of quality. That's I mean, cool. Amazing. I don't know if it's doable because can you really produce that much uh, footage at that high quality and not take 15 years to make it? <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, but but mm. there's, there's probably, that, that it's probably a place where animation could be really, really successful, where you all of a sudden binge watch, not with your wife in the middle of the night, but you watch it with your family on a Friday night, like the way um, you used to watch, uh, what was it called, the Disney? Oh, oh, the Wonderful World of Disney. Yeah, the Wonderful World of uh, Disney. Yeah, yeah. Our family sat in front of the TV and watched, watched the, uh, the, you know, the, that episode with, with the entire family. No, it's cool. That's very cool. Simon, I know you've got like a big meeting, you know, later on today, but uh, do, yeah. listen, uh, it, for me, like you're, you've always been an inspiration, like from your 2D work into your CG work. Um, and did you ever get to animate? Same back, like, by the way. Same uh, back, <laughs> Simon, uh, you, did you get to animate on any of the movies? I mean, I know you, I mean, your time is spent like directing, you know, the animation, but did you ever get like a little bit of time? Oh, to, yeah. oh, I just want to animate this one shot here. Oh, yeah, yeah, for here. Sure. I mean, it, it, in the, at the height of the production, it got always really difficult and it would be really sparse. But I, I'm a strong believer that, if you're a directing animator or a uh, supervising animator and you don't animate, you forget how difficult it is. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then your notes and directions become, you become a little bit of a joke. Like I, I, I never wanted to be a talking head. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Right, sometimes right. I turn into one, but I, I, I always wanted to at least have a shot on my desk that I can work on. And, um, so yeah, I, I think on every, on all three movies, I, I must have animated uh, some 20 shots at least. You know? Nice. Wow. Yeah. Not, I mean, not, it's not that much. And some of the shots were really short and simple, but, but I, I always had something on my desk and to, to the, you know, to the horror of production because some of these shots would sometimes stay on my desk for two months. You know? <laughs> yeah, right. When is that shot being done? So. <laughs> but yeah, no, I absolutely, I, and I, I, in particular, um, I always, I mean, I always did, I'm, I'm most of the time I animated on Toothless and Cloud Jumper uh, because um, we were always short on really good Toothless animators. Right. It, it, in, a, in a way, it was the, it was a, 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 a character that needed many, many skills from, you have to be technical, you had to understand appeal and make him charming because Toothless could, could look terrible. I mean, I don't know. When you look at the TV show, you can see the difference of how Toothless can look when right. it's badly animated. And there's amazing animation in the TV show. I'm not saying that but it's all But they don't animated. have time. Like, yeah. But you can see, like, okay, well, now it just looks like a gecko or uh, some strange, you know, gargoyle. And uh, Toothless is really, a, is really a, an appealing character when you do it right. And then Cloud Jumper was just very, very cha technically challenging because he had, you know, uh, two sets of wings, a tail with, with multiple uh, um, uh, wing flaps and, and spikes. And like they're, they're some of the, the challenging characters and that. I, I, I wanted to animate on those characters because I wanted to help in those characters. Mm -hmm. And that's what I've been doing from the first, I mean, from the first movie I animated mostly on Toothless. Wow, I can't wait to see it now. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah for yeah, sure. I, I really, honestly, uh, I am very proud of how we managed to wrap up this trilogy and it's a very emotional film like in a, in a good way in a, in a in an uplifting um uh heartfelt satisfying kind of way um i think it, i think it turned out great and fantastic i think the fans will be will be satisfied with how dean managed to make it 
a, a sort of a really um, enclosed functioning trilogy that really makes sense from beginning to end. That's a, that's quite a feat. That's quite a feat. Yeah. Well, Simon, I honestly, looking at your 21 years, I feel like we've just scratched the surface, but it's been a really cool interview. And I really, as Jay kind of pointed out earlier too, just really appreciate your time on this for sure. Thank um, you very much. It was an honor. Lovely talking to you guys. <laughs> and best of luck to you in, in the future. I'm sure I would love to get you in on another podcast and so see what kind of where you're at and what you're up to. Yeah, and just one more thing I, I need to say, well, thank you for creating it, uh, for, for helping to bring many animators to mm -hmm. the level that we need it and bring them into the industry. And I can only say that the one impression I had so far from taking meetings at all the studios and seeing what they're up to is the, the, this industry will, will try, is attempting to create an insane amount of content. Mm. And the one thing that we're short of is amazing animators. So <laughs> you guys, whoever's listening to this, like, get ready because there's going to be work out there. All and right. The next five years, it's, it's bustling. So it's going to be a golden age, right? Lots of amazing <laughs> jobs out there. <laughs> well, thank well, you again here. so much, Simon. I really yeah, Thank it. you, guys. Thank you very much, Simon. Best of luck. All right. See you guys later. Take All right. care. Take care, buddy.